Hello and welcome back to Read Becca. Women in Translation Month is over now and I wanted to wrap up everything that I read. So Women in Translation Month was the whole month and there was a readathon, the Wit Readathon, hosted by Matt Sharapa, Kendra Winchester, and insert a literary pun here, and uh, they set up a couple of challenges for a week-long readathon, but I kind of fudged and did, didn't pay attention to how long that week was running and just used those prompts that they had as a guide. So their prompts were not a novel and uh, any language that you haven't read before or haven't read in a long time. So I, I did pretty good. I only read one novel and most of the stuff I had read before but not in a long time, so I think I hit the prompts pretty well. So I will link all the information to their challenges and everything down below. But let's get into the books. So I'm gonna jump right in because these were really thought-provoking and um, I have a lot to say about all of them, so I'm going to try to keep it edited. Um, we'll, we'll see how, how quickly I get through this. But first up I had Beowulf, a new translation, which obviously we don't know who the author was, probably a man, but um, we have a new translation by Maria Devana Headley, and this specifically kind of tries to look at things through a feminist lens, and that's really interesting in the way that it's done. Um, Maria spends some time at the very beginning in the introduction explaining those choices pretty in depth, so I enjoyed that a lot. Um, the the terminology people are using to refer to this translation is bro wolf specifically because uh, she used the word bro in the translation and very modern vernacular. So it's interesting to read in the moment and um, I've talked about that before in other conversations where um, this kind of is very of the moment. It feels a little bit to me like 10 things I hate about you where that was such a of its time uh, translation, not translation, adaptation of The Taming of the Shrew. And so it really worked in that time, but if you have gone back and watched it, it probably feels pretty dated. Still very beloved, but um, it certainly was of its time. And I think that's where this is going to fit. Uh, some of the writing feels very much like spoken word poetry, and I, I enjoyed that a lot. Um, and it has a very contemporary voice. Um, there's kind of a back and forth between both the very contemporary sections, things like, um, meanwhile, Beowulf gave no shits. <laughs> That's an actual line. Um, or, uh, you know, it translates back into kind of uh, older sounding text. And so it does go back and forth. It's not all in this entirely contemporary terminology. So in this feminist lens, it's really interesting because uh, we have these chest pounding warriors who um, have all of their feats that they've accomplished, but in the end, when they're facing the end of their life, that's all very hollow um, compared to the things that really matter, um, the people in their lives that they've kind of pushed aside and um, and we really see that come to fruition. So I thought that was a very, very interesting take on, on this work. I really enjoyed that one. Um, the second one that I read was Soul Lanterns by Shaw Kazuki and translated by Emily Ballastieri. And I read this, I started this before the month, but it counts. I read most of it in this month. And it is a post Hiroshima Japan setting where these children realize there are kind of holes in people's lives where they lost loved ones from Hiroshima and um, they don't have bodies to bury. And so this is all about the grieving process that uh, people have gone through in absence of actually um, finding a body to bury or um, even holding out hope that they, they think their loved ones might still be out there even though it's years later. And it was so interesting how um, there is this discussion of storytelling as a cathartic um, way of dealing with grief. And so I think these, these children kind of rally together through the community and ask people to tell the stories of their loved ones and share it as kind of a project that they, they pull together. So this was a wonderful um, mid-grade that, that really explored that and had such a sense of time and place um, and evaluating your own internal grief was so powerful. So next up I had, um, jumping into the works that were up to the prompts, I have a manga, and this is What Did You Eat Yesterday, Volume 1 by Fumi Yoshinaga, 
and translated by Maya Rosewood. And um, this is a food manga. And I'll show you some art here. It's delicious. So I really enjoyed this, but I think from the translation perspective, this was maybe the weakest because there was a lot about it um, that was maybe either too directly translated or needed more cultural context in here. Um, because we effectively have a story that alternates between the food Ashiro likes to cook and so he's regularly making these meals and we're getting these scenes of him cooking uh, and then the other thing that it's covering is that we have this couple Shiro and Kenji who are a gay couple and they're they're grappling with being gay in Japan and it's a very slice of life so really it's just their day-to-day -day conversations but we have Shiro, uh, who is not out at work, he, he's a lawyer, and Kenji, who is a hairstylist, and he is very much out at work. And so they, they discuss the challenges they have with that and with the people that they know, um, both in their personal life and their professional life, and how they deal with that. And we also have familial expectations. So Shiro's mom, he really dreads her calls because she's, she seems like one of those parents who initially was really trepidatious about his being gay and um but then went full on and kind of reminded me of um I can't remember the character's name but there was a, a mom in Queer as Folk who worked at a diner and she kind of became the mom to everybody and would have been in P-Flag and you know over the top support and to the point that it kind of bothered her son well I think this is kind of the same thing where she she really is um, overly supportive and he kind of cringes every time she calls. So those small moments I really enjoyed and I, I, I just thought this was a very sweet manga. But uh, one thing that just gave me the hugest kick out of this was that um, Sean the Book Maniac, who I will link down below, um, has talked about over the past year while they've been at home, um, his husband Kenji and he have had to kind of sit down at home and do haircuts and has told the story of that, that kind of moment, that snapshot of their lives several times. And in this, Shiro and Kenji, because Kenji is a hairstylist, they kind of have that, that exact moment plays out here where, um, you know, Kenji's like, oh, okay, ready for a haircut? And they, they sit down and have a haircut at home. And so it, it just was warmed my heart really to think of, you know, knowing, knowing Sean and having heard him talk about that scene and then seeing it play out. So enjoyed this one. So the next one that I have is Little Dancer, age 14, by Camille Loren, and translated by Willard Wood. And uh, this one is really interesting because, uh, or for me, it's really interesting because I had already read a little bit about this and really just talking about the plight of the dancers at this time at the Paris Opera, where this particular dancer would have been. And so this book really expands out onto, on that um, about both Degas, who is the artist of the sculpture, and the dancer, Marie van Gotham. And so at this time in the Paris Opera, these girls were very impoverished and they were really exploited because effectively they only had to pass from where they were at in uh, the streets of Paris. It was either try and become a dancer or you were going to end up in a brothel. And really those were not that different at all. Um, because these dancers at the time effectively were kind of sold off uh, to high paying donors um, for, for a night. And in many cases, in Marie's specific case, the mother of the girl was in fact the agent doing the brokering of that transaction. So um, we in fact have this, this great exploitation by a family member happening here. And so something sort of similar happens to Degas, where I, I don't have any pity for him whatsoever. Um, he was not he was not a particularly good man, but uh, he he made this sculpture in wax, and either he was too poor or uh, chose not to have that bronze cast. And the only reason that we have this still living today is because it was bronze cast after his death by his family members. And so it's they profited and uh, almost carried on his legacy because um, it was more, more beneficial to them to do that versus um, keeping his work in the way that he had it. 
So he showed all of this work, including Marie, as a wax sculpture, but it was since cast in bronze and um, there are 22 copies, I believe, of this particular work at museums throughout the world. And so it's almost that same. The family has benefited from him when he was quite, quite poor um, throughout his life. So I, I think that is a very common thread for um, artists throughout their lives. But this particular story is, is so interesting to, to read how um, this turned into a work. Um, it, it kind of evolved beyond what he intended it to be because it became a commentary on class. And he was very classist. Uh, so he thought she was very much the, the little rat that was being portrayed and was trying to portray her as a low class person. And the outrage that came about of him having portrayed her that way, of him portraying her clothed, um, was was viewed as vulgar um, because covering up the form was, was viewed as rude um, rather than exposing it. And so, so he uh, subverted the things that he was in fact intending um, in the popular response. So really, really interesting stuff here. And I think in terms of the translation specifically, this is a fairly recent release. It's from 2017. The writing at no point really felt like a translation. So I think the, the translation work was quite good on this. And so finally, we have Resistencia, Poems of Protest and Revolution. And this is introduced by Julia Alvarez, edited by Mark Eisner and Tina Escaja. And this is a collection of poetry. They're all in different languages. So starting from just the translation aspect, I think this is a wonderful, wonderful work um, because we have the poetry in both the original language and in English um, side by side, and it just really enhances the experience. And then beyond that, I have, I've marked this. So um, at the back, this entire section back here is all biographies of every single author and translator that is in here. Uh, and so you can see we've got a little section on each individual that's involved in this project. So I feel like this was just a wonderful um, collaboration and the way they put it together really respected and honored everybody that was involved. So I liked that. So then as far as the actual themes of this work, um, I mean, obviously it's in the title resistance, but this is really resistance and rebellion against um, oppression from governments, from business and corporations, um, oppression of the body. Interestingly, the only thing that overtly tackles bodily oppression, there's only one poem that, that really says it in the text, um, and that one actually gets into uh, rape, pregnancy, and abortion. All three of those topics come up as uh, relating to bodily oppression. So that's really interesting. Um, but overall, um, it talks about that as um, words being the weapon of the oppressed and really how these authors have fought back. In, in fact, many of the authors here um, were primarily activists in, in kind of their perception of themselves and writers second. Uh, so really they're, they're political activists here. So very interesting. Um, I just want to read a couple of short poems. I'm, I'm not a poet and this is definitely not professional quality reading, but I will do my best here. Um, so the first one that I want to read is The Rebel Word by Rick Raquel Verdesoto de Romo de Villa, translated by Juan Felipe Herrera. And this is quite a short one. We must hate that kind of peace where men sowed winter, the shimmering of a four leaf clover that only unfolds inside fence lands. If clouds gallop by, let them give us water as they come near. If there is bread in pieces, if a book adorns our hands, let reading voices roar. So that's the rebel word. And the next one I have is Strike by Jaconda Belli and translated by Mark Eisner, who was one of the, the editors of this collection. Strike. I want a strike where we all walk out, a strike of arms, of legs, of hair, a strike born from every body. I want a strike of workers, of drivers, of technicians, of doctors, of doves, of flowers, of children, of women. 
I want a giant strike that extends even to love, a strike that brings everything to a halt. The clock, the factories, the yard, the schools, the bus, the hospitals, the highway, the ports. A strike of eyes, of hands, and of kisses. A strike where it is forbidden to breathe. A strike where silence is born, so you can hear the footsteps of the tyrant as he walks away. So just really powerful work. And I, I don't read very much poetry, but there really was nothing in here that completely didn't resound for me in some way. Every single poem here had at least some lines that, that I loved. Um, there is one that was really a feminist poem, and it talks about unlearning, uh, unlearning the alphabet of submission. And that just is such a powerful line. I loved it. And that one is from The Only Woman by Bert Alicia Peralta. And so just every single piece in here really had something to say to me. So I would I would heartily recommend. I think this was the big winner of the readathon. And I picked this up specifically because of that challenge prompt to find something uh, that is not a novel. I really got on the search for poetry because of that. So I'm really thankful for this readathon for prompting me to seek this work out because I enjoyed it so much. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you participated in Women in Translation Month because it really got me out of my comfort zone and I found so many great works because of it. So um, did you read anything great for Women in Translation Month at all? Um, or have I prompted you to pick up any of these works? Thanks so much for coming along on this rambly chat with me.